Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch. I'm your host, Vikas Swaroop. Two weeks ago, we discussed the United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP26, in Glasgow, and the leadership role India has taken in climate action. COP26 ended on the 13th of November, with nearly 200 countries adopting the Glasgow Climate Pact, which made an unprecedented mention of the role of fossil fuels in the climate crisis and called for the phasing down of coal power and phasing out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. The agreement has been described as the last chance for humanity to save itself from a climate catastrophe and the first ever international effort to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. To meet this goal, global emissions need to be reduced by 45% by 2030 and to nearly zero by 2050. Experts say the only way for this to be possible is for the world to make more extensive use of renewable energy, especially solar energy, which is seen as critical to addressing both climate change and energy poverty. The sun has been worshipped as a life giver to our planet since ancient times. But modern science gave us the understanding of sunlight as an energy which can be stored and utilized. Every hour, the sun releases the equivalent energy of 430 quintillion joules, while the total amount of energy that all humans use in a year is 410 quintillion joules. So if just one hour of direct sunlight was collected and generated into electricity, it could run the operations of the entire world for a whole year. The question is, if we have a virtually limitless source of clean energy in the form of solar power, why are we not capturing it and harnessing it as much as we should? And that is where the International Solar Alliance, or ISA, comes in. The ISA is an initiative proposed by India and was launched by Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris on the 30th of November, 2015, along with the then President of France. The ISA started out as an alliance of the sunshine countries, that is, the countries lying in between the two tropics, Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, which receive sunshine for more than 300 days in a year, with the objective of ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Subsequently, the ISA framework agreement was amended to allow all the member states of the United Nations to join the grouping. Most recently, the United States joined it as the 101st member. This treaty-based international organization is headquartered in India, in Gurugram, and aims to mobilize investments of more than $1 trillion by 2030 to help countries expand their solar power grids to meet their energy needs through low-cost financing, technologies, innovation, R&D, and capacity building. The main purpose of the ISA is to bring together countries, both rich and poor, on a common platform to promote solar energy across borders. And this vision got a significant boost on the 2nd of November, when Prime Minister Modi launched the Green Grids Initiative, One Sun, One World, One Grid, jointly with Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom at the COP26 Leader Summit in Glasgow. The thinking behind this ambitious project is that the sun never sets and is a constant at some geographical location globally at any given point of time. So it plans to connect 140 countries through a common grid that will be used to transfer solar energy from parts of the world with excess renewable power to those which are deficient and thus enable the use of solar energy 24 hours a day. It's a fascinating idea, bringing together technology, financing and international cooperation. So, in today's program, we will try to better understand the entire solar ecosystem by speaking to three guests who are all acknowledged experts in their fields. Joining me in the studio is Dr. Ajay Mathur, the Director General of the International Solar Alliance. Dr. Mathur is a global leader in promoting a low carbon and cleaner economy. As Director General of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in the Government of India from 2006 till 2016, he was responsible for bringing energy efficiency into our homes, offices, and factories through initiatives such as the Star Labeling Program for Appliances and the Energy Conservation Building Code. 
He was Director General of Terry, the Energy and Resources Institute from 2016 till February 2021, when he was elected Director General of the ISA. Joining us from Bangkok is Ms. Deepali Khanna, the Managing Director of Asia Region Office of the Rockefeller Foundation. She is an international development professional with extensive experience spearheading not-for-profit and philanthropic operations across the globe. She managed one of the foundation's flagship initiatives in India, Smart Power for Rural Development, to provide affordable and clean energy access to over a million people in India. And joining us from Ahmedabad is Mr. Ramesh Nair, CEO of Adani Solar, India's largest vertically integrated solar cell and module manufacturer with a capacity of 1.5 gigawatts. Welcome to all the guests. And Dr. Mathur, let me begin with you. Given that there are already a number of international organizations that work on renewable energy, like the International Renewable Energy Agency, the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, etc., what was the need for the ISA? And why did India take the lead in proposing it? Across the world, solar in particular makes great sense as an energy source. It's available everywhere and it has the potential to become the cheapest form of energy. We have also seen how it has grown in India. The Indian experience in manufacturing, much less in manufacturing, but much more in deployment, in the ability to build up the institutions for its distribution are what every developing country needs. While there are other institutions, this focuses on solar. And most importantly, it focuses on projects. Because in many countries, unless they see projects, they will not be convinced that this makes sense. We saw the need for a separate organization. India, as you mentioned, and France spearheaded it. And here we are now, five years later, where I believe the Solar Alliance has come of age. Mr. Nair, if solar energy is the panacea, for everything from the environmental crisis to energy poverty, then why are we using so little of it? And what are the technological and financial challenges that solar energy faces? Uh, if you see in India, uh, about in the current power metrics, about uh, 20 percent or less than about uh, 20 percent, 24 percent of the overall power is from renewable sources. And uh, I think chunk of it is from solar, about uh, out of what 100, 100 gigawatt installed, about 40 gigawatts are from solar alone, and plus the remaining is in uh, rooftop, another 6 to 10 gigawatts. Uh, I think it's picking up. I think what we see is that the potential of solar is very high, but obviously uh, there are areas wherein it has not taken off. Uh, the country has been slow, but in the last few years, the I think the CAGR has been uh, in excess of about 20% in terms of growth of the renewable sector. And uh, certain areas like rooftop, microgrids, and those kind of things have not really taken off in the country the way it should have taken off. And, uh, and, because, and these, these things would be uh, where we would see the growth happening. If you see how the country has positioned itself, we're talking about something like about 50% of the total energy needs would come from renewable sources by 2030. And uh, that will be sizable. And wherein the, the overall share of thermal power would fall to something like about 54 percent, 50 to 54 percent in the overall share. So I think it's only a matter of time. Uh, the the focus on the sector would uh, gallop it. Uh, there is a huge, as you rightly said, a huge potential. Uh, some numbers which which I had, which talks about that uh, India definitely, as you said, has a huge potential for solar power uh, because of its uh, geographical positioning and about 300 years of sunlight, 300 days of sunlight in a year. And uh, it's only time that we, it's only time that we tap it and then sort of make the most of it. Now turning to you, uh, Deepaliji, one of the biggest challenges that solar energy projects face is finding financing, because you know many of these are small projects and banks are reluctant to fund something where they feel the risk element is very high. So what can be done to remove this bottleneck? So you're absolutely right. Financing is a huge issue. And I think I'll tackle it from multiple points of view. So one is really where, you know, countries that have made commitments aren't coming forward to really ensure that the developing world that needs the financing gets it. So I think there's a lot more work that needs to be happening to really 
hold governments accountable towards the commitments that they've made. So there's one aspect around that. The other aspect is that, you know, when there's financing that is available, there's a struggle to really find bankable projects, to really have business models that are really, and in the infancy stage, I think there's a lot of need for flexible capital. So, you know, whether you're looking at grants, or you're look at, looking at innovative financing instruments, whether it's debt equity, to really be able to trigger and get these business models to a place where they can be scalable and sustainable. So I think that's another area where, you know, a lot of financing bottlenecks are coming up because, you know, where is the pipeline and where are we able to address some of the issues that relate to the policy environment? So, for example, in India, 10 years ago, when we started working in the renewable energy space, and we really wanted the private sector to come forward, the two things that they really had as huge bottlenecks was one was the policy enabling environment. What happens when the grid comes and they're looking at, you know, they distributed renewable energy work that they're doing. So the grid connectivity and all the aspects around that. The other piece was their conviction and their trust in really understanding that rural consumers would be willing to pay. So I think what we were really able to do was really work with them to really address some of these bottlenecks to really see how technology could be a real enabler in driving down costs because for that effective business model, we also know that there's a lot of technology and innovation that is needed for which again, you know, you all can't be working in silos, but how do you kind of really collaborate effectively so that you can take all these business models to a scalable level and financing will flow. So I think that's how I would really say that, you know, one can be much more effective. And I think, you know, as a foundation, that's exactly what we're trying to do. At COP26, we've launched the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And we, as a foundation, have committed $500 million into it. It's a $10 billion platform for the first year. We have IKEA Foundation. We have Bezos Foundation. All three of us have committed $1.5 billion. But we've also been able to get $8.5 billion from the multilateral development banks, the bilaterals. So, you know, and we've also made a commitment that over the next 10 years, we will continue to raise $10 billion to get it to $100 billion. So this, this is philanthropic foundations having these bold aspirations and making sure that financing is available. And I'm sure, you know, with the kind of impact and results we can show on the ground, there will be more, much more resources flowing in. Excellent. Dr. Mathur, at the core of the ISA is the understanding that the coming together of countries that get about 300 days of sunshine in a year will expand the global solar market, the bigger volumes will bring down costs, and this in turn will spur demand and R&D. But many of the countries have poor technological capabilities and inadequate financing that could come in the way of their leveraging this platform. So what is the ISA doing to ameliorate this? I think that all countries face three kinds of problems. The first is that of information. Solar is an area in which progress occurs amazingly fast. So if a country wants to move ahead on solar, it shouldn't move ahead based on yesterday's knowledge, but on today's and some idea of where we are going tomorrow. So the first thing that the ISA is doing is putting together the global knowledge and bringing it out for all its member countries. There's an ease of doing solar report. There will be reports on the status of solar technology, solar investments, solar markets. So that's the first part. It allows advocacy to be up to date. The second is about making money flows. We have partnered with the Global Energy Alliance for Planet and People, which Dipali just talked about. And our goal is we create the projects which could be funded for preparation by this alliance, where possibly risk mitigation measures could be provided so that in turns it attracts funding. So that's the second. The third is if you want to do this, you need people. You need local banks who can evaluate projects. You need people who can manage and design these projects. You need policymakers who understand this. So that's the third area that we focus on, which is people and policy capacity building. And finally, the fourth, which is actually a differentiating factor, is we focus on projects, on developing the projects. This is what our inputs to the Global Energy Alliance would be. This is when countries see these projects happening, then they have the resolve, they have the confidence to move 
their policies and processes so that a second project happens, a fifth project happens, a hundredth project happens. So I would say that those are the four major areas in which the alliance is working. Mr. Nair, Adani Solar is India's fastest growing solar company. In fact, India has seen an exponential growth in its renewable energy sector in the past five years. So what has changed and why is India the new hotspot for renewable energy investors? Yes, uh, at Adani, we do about uh, 1.5 gigawatts of uh, manufacturing of solar uh, panels and cells. And we also have development to our Adani Green Energy, about uh, 25 gigawatt of pipeline is there at this point of time. And uh, so we are definitely a leading player in the clean energy sector in the country. We wanted the first to invest in the fully integrated manufacturing facility in the country. What has changed at this point of time in the last couple of years is obviously the focus by the Honorable Prime Minister uh, to shift the energy uh, transition into clean energy. So the, clear, the, the creation of the Na National Clean Energy Fund and the, the focus of 175 gigawatt by December 2022. And the focus on that has actually propelled the movement of RE energy in the country. And uh, you know that recently the target of 450 gigawatt by 2030 was revised to 500 gigawatts also. Mm -hmm. And out of which about 300 to 350 gigawatts will be just solar and the remaining will be wind and the other sectors and maybe even small hydro forming part of the RE sector. I think uh, the challenges are uh, plenty, but uh, the focus of the country to completely uh, revamp its energy mix uh, primarily into renewable by 2030 uh, is a tall order, but obviously as a country, we have to gear up to work towards it. Uh, just to reach the target of 450 gigawatts, we're talking about something like about 40 gigawatts of development every, uh, every year uh, now on. And that's a huge order that we're talking about, the challenges in regarding funding, the challenges as regards clearances, environment, and many things would obviously be part of it. But then I think as a country, we would be quite close to those numbers. So, and uh, the various policies and the various uh, 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 positive environment that the government has created and recently also the PLI scheme uh, where they're pushing into manufacturing too. Productivity linked incentive, yes. That's development and actually has given a huge impetus to this industry at this point of time. Uh, Mr. Nair, renewable energy has become cheaper than any other form of electricity. Can you share with us the figures and how do you see the trend? How much lower can we expect prices to head? Uh, it's very difficult to comment on the pricing because uh, we have seen uh, uh, pricing of around 2.4 rupees per unit. And uh, there have been some bits where you have seen prices even lower than that. Uh, but then I wouldn't say that uh, prices uh, would sustain at this level because uh, there are various uh, things that go into this pricing, including the pricing of the equipments and then the pricing of the land, the, uh, the, the, the policy structure within the country. Uh, and we have to also look at that there has to be pricing which is sustainable which makes the RE projects sustainable across a long period of time. The, the, the war or the, the, the push cannot be to just keep lowering the prices, but it has to be also to ensure that all the RE projects that are actually in place do not uh, end up being an NPA in this price of war. Because today also, if you see the latest reports, there was a re report about a few months back, which talks about uh, out of about 230 projects that Irida has lent, about something about 70, 80 are looking to be uh, sort of an NPA sort of uh, situation. So I would say the, the pricing would be currently sustained at this level. It will it may inch upwards also a little more, but definitely it will be lower than coal pricing. It is already about uh, much lower than what a coal plant can generate. And that 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 advantage and that strategic advantage of uh, that the RE power would be much cheaper than coal would remain. But I wouldn't second guess on that. It will go lower than this because there are various things that will play into the whole thing because there, is, there are uh, multiple parameters which determine the tariffs. So my guess is it will remain at this level or it may slightly uh, be maybe a few paise here and there up, up and down, uh, not, not, not sizable. It may, uh, it may remain at this band of less than three rupees for a sizable period of time. Dr. Mathur, you wanted to come in on this? Well, I think in addition to what Mr. Nair mentioned, I think the big, breakthrough that we are looking at is the cost or the price of round-the-clock electricity. Mm -hmm. So solar plus batteries. Today, solar plus, you know, if you're looking at the night when solar is not available, we are really looking at fossil fuel-based electricity across the world. I mean, this is across, true across all countries. 
We have not yet come to the point where round the clock solar electricity is cheaper than fossil fuel electricity. Right. But that's a change which we expect will happen in the, over the next three years. Once that happens, there is absolutely no reason to invest in new fossil fuel capacity for economic reasons. Absolutely. I think that's a very valid point you make. Uh, this brings me to uh, <coughs> Ms. Dipali Khanna. You worked on rural areas in India as part of the Rockefeller Foundation's project called Smart Power for Rural Development. So tell us, how can solar help rural communities in particular? I think I've seen it for myself in my, you know, house um, addressing the issues of access, reliability, and affordability that uh, solar energy uh, did provide. We could drive economic development across rural India. Currently, we have 500 mini grids that are operating in UP, Bihar, and Jharkhand. And we are able to see how not only existing enterprises, because they now have access to reliable energy, have been able to really increase their income levels, but we've also been able to get new enterprises into the villages. So on one side, we've seen a thriving economic activity, which is happening because people now know when electricity would be made available, and they can make a demand and hold the private energy serving companies that are providing energy to be more accountable. Uh, so that's the first piece. The second piece that one, what one saw was the children could study longer hours. Yes. And you know, we, we actually have instituted impact studies to really see what was the state before renewable energy came into the villages and what happened post. So we've also looked at the number of hours, so at least two hours extra was what kids could study. In the past, they were using flickering kerosene lights and the eye infections and their ability to really grasp things is quite different. So even in terms of school performance, you could see metrics where there was an increase. The third aspect I'd like to highlight is the safety and security of women and young girls. You know, now they can be moving around in the evening because you had community street lighting. The fourth piece, which I found very, very, um, as a woman, I found really uh, exciting was where women were feeling much more empowered. So they could now watch you know, any Bollywood film uh, without really having to worry who else is looking at that film. They had a choice of what to watch and when to watch and what access to information they could have because now that they had energy, they had the internet services, they were in that position. And finally, the decision-making also of women, you know, in terms of where and how they would be placing that light bulb if you left it to the men, and sorry for my panelists who are on with me, they're all men, but you know, the men folk would be looking at where can they be sitting in the evening and having a drink or two, and women would be thinking of where within the kitchen and where the kids could be studying is where the light bulb could be placed. So I've seen firsthand how solar energy has been able to drive the well-being of millions of rural consumers and really being able to kind of build up the trust and confidence and help them to be looking at the world quite differently. Now, I've been in the development sector for three decades, and I know, you know, to really bring about and address intergenerational poverty, it takes a long time. But with energy, you could really see instant gratification. You could see a solar energy plant being put up in six weeks and the whole village looking quite different. So I think it's very, very exciting to see the difference that solar energy has been able to bring about across thousands of villages. I think, Dr. Mathur, you also received some instant gratification recently when the United States decided to join the International Solar Alliance as the 101st member. So tell us, how significant is this move by the United States? I think it's very significant. On the one hand, they are the 101st country to join, so you could say, oh, well, so what? But remember, in this world, they are the font of most technological innovation that occurs. They are the largest energy user in the world. As they move to solar energy, both in terms of the development on the manufacturing side as well as the development on the retrofit side, their experiences become amazingly important to all of us. The world's largest emitter has now joined the ISA, but I see from your list that the world's second largest emitter has still not joined. So tell us, why is China holding out? So, we would very, very much like China to be a member of the Solar Alliance. They have a very ambitious solar program. They are the developing country voice in many, many sectors. We would like them to be part of the Solar Alliance as soon as possible. Now, this one world, one sun, one grid is a very ambitious project. 
which can transform the renewable energy landscape completely if it becomes a reality. I believe the ISA is already building a solar pipeline of nearly five gigawatts installed capacity in order to achieve the vision of interconnected global grids. So tell us, what are the opportunities and the challenges of this mammoth project? Well, first of all, look at what happens in East Asia in the evening. As the sun sets, fossil fuels will have to start coming in. Unless, because it's still day in India, you can get solar electricity from India to flow to East Asia. That can only be possible with a grid. Similarly, when it's evening in India, it's still daylight in the Middle East, in Egypt. And therefore, electric, solar electricity from those parts of the world will help meet our needs. An interconnected world would make it possible for all of us to be far more greener than we could be on our own. Second, there are many parts of the world where there is space which is sparsely populated. Australia comes to mind. North Africa comes to mind. And Australia to Singapore line would help Singapore become green. And North Africa to Europe line would help Europe become green. We believe that the interconnection of regional grids would help us all become greener. It would be of benefit to the exporter nation. It would be of benefit to the importer nation. Mr. Nair, India today ranks fourth in wind power, fifth in solar power, and fourth in renewable power installed capacity as of 2020. Can India lead the world as a low-cost supplier of clean energy? Yes, definitely. I think uh, you have said it in your opening uh, comments also. So there is no uh, there is no doubt about the fact that India cannot lead the world in terms of clean energy. I think India would lead as we go forward. Uh, the kind of vision that we have for the country and also the current impetus on manufacturing, both combined together, I think, uh, with that integration that we have of development towards manufacturing and self-sufficiency and self-reliance uh, within our own country would actually propel us to become leaders in clean energy uh, in the next maybe a decade. Excellent. Final question is for you, Ms. Dipali Khanna. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a devastating toll on lives, livelihoods, and economic activities globally. However, a silver lining to the cloud was that it enabled us to catch glimpses of a better world. Cleaner air, bluer skies, and reduced pollution, besides reinforcing the value of public health. Renewable energy promises all these things. So can it drive the global post-COVID recovery? Um, I think it has a very, very important role to play, and we've seen what it has been able to do. So how do we really build the momentum? Because as I was saying, you know, the way uh, access to reliable energy can drive economic development, we've seen that. So, you know, we can create more jobs, we can create more enterprises, we can really address the carbon emissions through the renewable energy work. So I think as, you know, and again, I'm so, we are so privileged at the Rockefeller Foundation to have the International Solar Alliance as a delivery partner because, you know, this is where the aspiration is to expand this work across 60 countries and really see how we can be positioning all the work around renewable energy to be able to really help us achieve the sustainable development goals. We, we have a lot of good examples, but really, you know, how do we ride on this moment and really link it up with the climate call to action which definitely renewable energy offers so much of hope. So I really hope that we're all going to be collaborating more effectively to really be able to see how ending energy poverty becomes a reality to drive economic development across the globe. Thank you very much, Dipali ji. Thank you very much, uh, Ramesh Nayarji. And of course, Dr. Ajay Mathur for sharing your insights with us. Solar energy is indeed the way forward for a cleaner, greener, and sustainable future. That concludes this edition of Diplomatic Dispatch. Till next week, good evening and goodbye.